I'm not going to present a new software package this time. Give this more kind of um, thought process that mainly Yona and myself went through in the past month, because as you know, we are working on this platform. And one of the questions or one of the aspects of the questions we would like to ask uh, are time-based questions. And so we are archaeologists and archaeology, we are dealing with time. There are not that many tools that deal with time. And we were thinking, okay, how can we keep track of time? How can we reason with time? And we don't have a final answer yet. So these slides are more of the things that we have been discussing in the, in the past months. So to start off, we can say that if you look at the simple way that the universe is explained by, by Newton, so we don't take anything like string theory into account. Very often we say it's a four-dimensional universe. And why do we call it four-dimensional? Because every event that takes place in the universe has both a location and a time. And this location you can express with several coordinate systems. Normally it's expressed with three coordinates, so let's say x, y, z, but there can be many other coordinate systems. And time is a one-dimensional property. So although there is no inherent ordering in those, so you could first express something in X and Y and then in time and then in Z. So there is no dimensional ordering over time. You have to come to accept that when we talk about 3D, we mean the three uh, spatial locational properties and 4D or the four dimensional universe, then we add simply time. But there are of course more dimensions. We have color, we have smell. So the universe is almost uh, infinitely dimensional, so to say. Now, the thing is that in archaeology or in most sciences, we can deal pretty well with everything that concerns two-dimensional space or two-and-a-half-dimensional space because you have technologies like GIS. Three-dimensional space is already more difficult to analyze. And when we then also add time, then it becomes really complex. Now, the problem in Project Indigo, or let's say what I would like to have Project Indigo and our platform, is exactly this. We would like to show stuff in 3D and reason with time, which is exactly what most tools are not capable of doing. So yes, we set out on the path to mainly discuss internally in the team how we can how we can deal with this. Um, and one of the main things that became very clear is when we take a photograph, there are very different connotations that can, we can add to that moment. So let's say right now it's more or less in, in the future this. So in five minutes, let's say I take a photograph of this bird coffee to along the Dona Canal. And Holy quickly flies with her spaceship to Egypt, uh, to Egypt, to Pompeii, and she takes this bird uh, graffito um, photograph with some descriptions here. So we both have taken a photograph of a graffito at the exact same moment. But what does this moment really mean in the scope of graffiti research? Right? So it's both a date and a time for both of us. It's a creational event, but what is the creational event signifying? For many researchers here, we would also say, okay, the time that we took this photograph is the time that this graffiti was alive, and it would give a timestamp to the graffito. <clears throat> However, here nobody would say that this is the timestamp of this graffito in Pompeii, right? So it's a creational event that shows when the photograph was created, not when the graffito was created, which is one of the reasons why I said yesterday, for us, it's very important in Indigo that we separate the metadata of the digital derivatives and the physical reality that we are studying. So this is one important aspect. When do we really take the photograph and what does it signify? Now we could also say, okay, Stefan went along the Donau Canal to take photographs on the 3rd, on the 2nd of June, and this bird was not there. And this uh, photograph, um, he then took, uh, sorry, and then we saw on Instagram, for instance, that on the 6th of June, somebody already posted this bird, right? And we do, took then a photograph 10 days later. So we know on the 2nd, Stefan did not photograph it. On the 6th, it was posted on Instagram. So in between those four days, this bird must have uh, appeared along the Dono Canal. So here, the same with Holly. She knows everything was covered in Pompeii 79 after the uh, common era or into the common era. However, maybe we know that there is some dating material there that dates the plaster at let's say the earliest 41 after Christ. So we could say, okay, in this time span, this graffito was likely created. So here we can say the moment that we take the photograph, this graffito is around 12 days old, plus minus two days. And in this instance, we can say it's about 9,963 years old, plus minus 19 years. So what you also see is that this date time that we have here does not relate to the temporal fuzziness of both the temporal fuzziness, sorry, of both the creation of 
the let's say the graffito as well as the temporal fuzziness by which we can say how long this graffito has been visible okay so and very often with what Holly is studying or the ancient gra graffiti people are studying um, this temporal uncertainty or this temporal fuzziness is very extended so we are talking about years we are very often talking about days sometimes about hours right um, and it is reflected, as I said, both in terms of the graffiti creation, this fuzziness, so we have an uncertainty when something was created because we cannot be there all the time, but it is also related to the visibility. And here we know the moment we took that photograph, it was likely visible from the moment it was created. In the term of ancient graffiti, this is not always the case, right? It can be that this was covered at 79 after Christ and re-excavated, let's say, two weeks ago. So then we have like two um, time spans. We have the time span that it was visible back then, and then it became visible again this time. But if you look at the Colosseum in Rome, for instance, this was visible the whole time. So how do we deal with these temporalities? Because, okay, it was created back then, but it was visible the whole time. So also these time spans, they can be interrupted. They cannot be interrupted. So how do we deal with, with stuff like this? Um, and like I said, yeah, for us, this discussion internally really clearly led to the fact that we have to separate between metadata concerning the real graffito and everything that we derive from it being photographs polygons 3d models and so forth they have different metadata sets different copyrights different time steps and so forth and so forth so if we try to visualize this what i try to visualize here is i try to visualize that Stefan goes along the Donau Canal and he is photographing and he photographs new graffiti. And here I visualize the visibility certainty. So how certain are we that the specific graffito is visible? So let's say he goes along the Donau Canal, he photographs and we have graffito one visible in his photograph. So we are 100% certain that this graffito is there. A few days later, he goes again, he does another observation. Yes, the graffito is certainly still there. Then he goes another time, <laughs> And then at a certain point, let's say a week later, is the last time that he observes that graffito. Then a week later, he goes again. He does not see that graffito anymore, but he photographs another one. So at that time, we know, okay, second graffito is 100% visible. We know it because we have a photograph of it. However, what we can now also say is that in between that, these two periods, this graffito became invisible at a certain moment. And we don't know exactly when this appeared because we took a photograph here, but it get, could have started here it could have started here so the best we can do is something like this we can say this one the visibility ends completely when this one becomes visible for sure and here the visibility starts when we know for sure the last time that the first one was visible then he continues we observe more graffito too so we are certain it's still there until at a certain point we also do the last observation and we have a new observation of a new graffito and just the same reasoning using as before we can again draw these lines and say at this point of time that you observe the third graffito, this one is not visible for sure. And this one is starting to become visible. We just don't know yet. Uh, we don't know really when this happens. So we draw these lines like this. And maybe this first observation was also the last observation. And then this stays open. Um, let's say we could also say Project Indigo ends here. So we won't, won't know how long this stays visible. But let's say for completeness, we simply draw these lines like this. Good. So now what can we what can we learn from this? We can see that we have a, a visibility time span here between the first and the last photograph. So this is the certain visibility span. We have a visibility span that is that we call the uncertain one. So from the first moment something could be visible till the last moment. And these are our temporal fuzzy zones, right? So we don't know when the graffito became in, came into existence and when it stopped uh, being visible so these are our temporal fuzzy zones so what we observe from this is that the more we go along the donor canal and photograph well let's say the less we would go along the donor canal and photograph the more we would reduce the certainty and the more we would increase the uncertainty so that's why we try to do photographs every four five six days so to say because the more observations we do the more we can decrease this uncertainty and visibility, and the more we can increase the, the certainty visibility spans that we're showing in something that's visible. Good. If we beautify this a little bit, we take all these things away, we come to such a graph like this, and then we could do some reasoning. So for instance, we want to do our query on our platform and say, okay, at that time, tell me which graffito is visible. We know for certain graffito one is 100% visible, and we know for certain that graffito two and three were not visible. If we 
us and the platform how does this work in two days, then we know, okay, if you would draw these two lines further, then we would know, okay, we have like a 30% visibility, um, let's say certainty of Grafita 1, we don't know for sure, and a 70% visibility of Grafita 2, we know for certain that Grafita 3 was not visible, right? However, this seems like a nice graph until you start realizing, yeah, but okay, Grafito is a two-dimensional property, not a point property. So if this is Grafito 1, this is Grafito 2, and this is Grafito 3, the only thing that this line represents is a point that is located here, right? Because a point that is located here stays visible the entire time. It's only for this point that this timeline holds. So that's why when we made this drawing and we were working on graphics, so our software for polygons, we thought, okay, we have to represent these different graffiti by polygons. And we try to track these polygons over time and try to reason with them over time. So how do we get towards these polygons? <clears throat> so we go back to this graph and let's say we add a few observational points. So let's say we have time point number one, we have the time point number one plus three days, so we call this time point number two, so time point number two, and then time point number three, four, and five. So we have now this timeline, we put it on top here so that you see. And what you would like to come to, so in the next slide you will see stuff that I did manually, but this we would like to come to in an automated way, is that we say, okay, we have Grafito 1, Grafito 2, Grafito 3, in terms of polygons. And we would like to automatically derive the visibility of a certain Grafito through time. So here we have the visibility of Grafito 1, Grafito 2, Grafito 3. So Grafito 1, the moment that we are observing it here, this entire polygon is visible. So we could say it is visible from time point number 1 till time point number 2. This is what this interval indicates. It has an uncertainty from here until minus infinity. And it has an uncertainty temporal interval from here until here, because here we know that this one is 100% visible uh, at this point, right? So at this moment of time that we observe the second graffito, we know, okay, only these parts of this graffito are still visible. So they started at T1 and they run at least till T4. And they have, again, this uncertainty in the balls. And then when the third graffito comes on top of it, this one also appears, disappears, sorry. And then this one lives further. So this one, this has a temporal span that we know for certain from T1 till T5 with two uncertainty spans. So in the end, this graffito one, this polygon can be split into three polygons and each of them have a different temporal uh, dimension, di different temporal span, uh, so to say. Now, if you do this also for graffito number two, we have a get exactly the same reasoning as you see here, and for uh, graffito number three, exactly the same. This does not overlap with anything. So this is then the, let's say, the visibility of graffito number three. It's just one point in time with this uncertainty at the ball. And the same we could do for the uh, invisibility. So for this one, only when it gets covered, this part of polygon one is invisible with its time span. And then at this point, a much larger portion of this polygon one is invisible also with its time span. And you could also do this for the other ones. So this is what we would like to come to in an automated way. We are not there yet, but we are getting towards this. Right? So what are the tools that we are using currently to, to, to play around with? Um, as I said before, event is based on location and time, so we need tools to extract both. Location we do using Graphis, so the software I introduced yesterday, and Autograph, which is the software that Benjamin programmed to automatically auto rectify all the images. And time for the moment, we are programming some tools in MATLAB um, just to play around with stuff and to see what, how far we can get. And the, all the information we store in the GeoJSON uh, file format. Um, so I will explain this in the next few slides. And the idea is then that our urban chameleon platform then uses this GeoJSON file from it. I can do all the temporal reasoning with this. So in terms of location, um, you have seen the software yesterday. Let's say we have here this uh, Grafito. We are interested in this one, in Good TV Trust. Um, and we want to have the temporal uh, aspects related to this digitized. So the first thing we do is we make our polygon here with all the metadata, as I've seen, as you've seen yesterday. And at that point, we take this, this photograph and all the other photographs we took, because for every graffito, we take 10, 15 photographs, so we can model it in 3D. And um, as you see here, we can have a different identifier. This is something I will come later to. We can give the polygon. This is, can be the ID of the polygon, as well as the ID of the graffito itself. 
this draw different reasonings for this. And at this point, this polygon has 2D pixel coordinates because it is in the image, right? Then we make a 3D model, we texture this model, and we can automatically project this 2D polygon using our software into 3D. So at that point, our polygon gets 3D world coordinates. It's completely automatically georeferenced. One of the things we still have to do is how do we how do we simplify this again to real world coordinates but are just 2D? Because as you've seen, these polygons are two-dimensional to compute their overlap. And this is something we are still uh, working on. We will have a meeting next week uh, to that end. And to show you the problem, for instance, if you are working, let's say, on this graffito here, if I would now have a polygon that goes all around and I would project this on a flat surface, I would have problems with this because this surface would just project to a line, right? And the same with this part of the graffito. It's obviously part of the same one, but it's also a vertical surface that would project to a line. So these are things that we have to think about how we will deal with this. But let's say that we manage to do how do we then store this location? So we have computed it. How do we store it? In Gafis, we store it in our metadata, either in or next to the file, as I explained yesterday. In Autograph, we go to the GeoJSON format. And GeoJSON is an open uh, data format for data interchange, which is both human and machine readable, which is very important. So we can read it, but also machines can interpret it. So this is how it looks. So we have here type feature. This can have properties and it has geometry, and in the geometry, we store all the coordinates. So this can be parsed and be read by a machine, but also we humans can interpret this. Okay, so, and also, when we then go to our 2D polygon, this will be stored in the GeoJSON file. Now, how do we store time? So this is storing location. How do we store time? And for this, we will use this property field. Um, and the idea was, um, when we were working on this, you and I, myself, is A, it has to make sense. B, we would like to map this to side of CRM, which is an ontology which is used by Open Atlas. I will not delve into this today because it would become too complex. And also it should be mathematically derivable. So the idea we came up with is the following. So all the events that are related to the in situ, or let's say all the in situ uh, graffito related events can be the following. You have the production of a graffito. You have modifications, so stuff can be added or removed. And then at a certain point, maybe the wall gets broken down. So it is deployed. <laughs> this does not have to happen. It can happen. I will then later explain why there is a small gap here. Then you also have the state of the entire graffito. And this is important, the entire graffito. So when something gets produced or modified, as long as it's not completely covered, it is visible. Right? So we are talking about the entire graffito. So even if just a small part is still not covered, we consider it still visible. As soon as the last modification makes it completely covered, then we say it's invisible. And maybe at a certain point it gets destroyed, but it does not have to be. <laughs> and for us, important this, and I think there we also differ from many other projects, even when something is invisible, we still consider the graffito to be in existence. It is still there, right? It's only when something gets destroyed that the existence ends. And we try to infer all these dates, if possible, by doing as many observations, doing as many photo tours along the Donut Canal as possible. And you see this here in the GeoJSON file. So we have observation, production, modification, destruction, visible, and visible existence. So all these are stored there. And I collapsed them, so otherwise it would be too long to display. But any of those has um, the same properties. And to show those, uh, I'll show you the properties of the visible state. So how can we reason about visibility? Every of these properties that I show you here has the following structure. It has a start, it has an end, and it has a, a time span. And every start has an earliest start and a latest, and then the source where we derive this from. Every end has an earliest and latest and the source we derive it from. And then from these days, we can derive a minimum and a maximum time span. So to, just to give you an example, and then more or less start wrapping up this, this talk, is the following. <clears throat> Let's say we go out and we photograph this the 5th of September. A few days later, we photograph this one. A few days later, this one. And then we end up with this one. Okay. So at that moment, let's say we want to make this Zelensky Gafito uh, our core subject, and we want to track its temporality. Now, what do we know? We know that the moment we photograph, it's there for sure. So the latest possible start 
of that graffito is this date here. That's the latest possible start because it could have been painted, let's say, just a second before. We also know that here it was not there, but it could be that the creator came one minute later and started to paint this graffito. This we cannot know. So we can say that the earliest possible start is this date. In terms of ending, we know, okay, here it was still there, here it's not there anymore. So it could be that after this photograph, two minutes after this photograph, this was sprayed. So the earliest ending of this graffito is this date here. And the latest ending is this one here, because it could, this could have been sprayed just a moment after, um, or let's say a minute before we took the photograph. And then from these earliest and latest dates, we can have the time span. So the minimum time span, something was visible, and the maximum time span, something was visible. So this is the, the reasoning that goes behind this. Now, how do we compute time? And this is something that you are still in progress with, so I cannot show you a lot. The, this is the main idea, is that after every tour, <coughs> sorry, after every tour, we use autograph to manually make these polygons of every single individual graffito that we have. Then we use QGIS or MATLAB or Python, whatever, to put all these polygons into one big GeoJSON file. The next tour comes along, we do the same process. And at this point in time, we have two types of polygons. We can put them together, and then we can start doing reasoning and start to maybe infer dates from uh, at, at certain time points. Then we have a third tour. We again extract these polygons, we add them again, and we can again do some reasoning. And this reasoning is something that you're currently programming. So we are still um, not finished with this subject. So we are still trying to put all the puzzles, the pieces of the puzzle together, but it's also puzzling us in a way. So a lot of it is trial and error. As I said, one of the things we still have to solve is how do we come from a 3D polygon to a 2D polygon again? And of course, these polygons are subjective thresholds. If I would say where a graffito ends, I would delineate this maybe a bit different than Benjamin or Jona would or, or Stefan would because often these are these fuzzy outlines and you cannot really extract it per uh, perfectly, right? So it's a kind of subjective threshold. But still we think that it's a way of dealing with this because as I said already several times during this talk, for us it's important to distinguish between the real graffito and the digital derivatives. And these polygons, they allow us to derive information about location and temporality, we hope, that you otherwise would not get just from uh, observing the, the real graffito. That's it. Thanks. Thank you a lot for getting to talk again. Uh, please, can I have any questions? So, um, what I'm trying to imagine is how this uh, feature, this temporality, is going to be functioning in your uh, VR scan of like actually VR presentation of uh, then you come out. So could you explain it to me a little bit, like how you see it happening and something at the final project? I see it in my head, but how are you going to materialize it? It's yeah. something we still are dealing with yeah. because it's very important. I mean, I did not go into this, but there are two temporal reasonings that need to happen. The first temporal reasoning is to extract the data and put it into the polygon. But then also the platform needs to be able to do temporal reasoning because what we would like to do is we have a graffito A, let's say, give me the graffito that came before. So there needs to be some reasoning agent behind it that says, okay, if I have this date, what comes before all of this? And there are mathematical frameworks to do this. How we will exactly do this and visualize this is unsolved at this point. Yeah, but what I'm thinking about is like, okay, now you have like your project done, you have virtual reality of the uh, Danny Canal. I'm in the virtual reality and I'm walking by. Yeah. So what do I see and how do I go back and forth and how do I see these changes? Like if I'm like walking uh, along the line, I see all of the things that were done, I don't know, like in, in the January 2021. And then if I go back, walk the other way, maybe I'll see things done in January 22. So like, how, how do you see that? Like, I'm yeah. interested in this, like, when you are done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the we, we see it or I envision it, but it's not so easy to technically implement this as a slider like in Google Earth. 
So you walk through the, along the Donau Canal virtually at the 10th of September at 12 o'clock 15. And then you have a temporal slider. And if you change that slider, the graffiti scheme will change according to that temporal moment that you have chosen. This is, this is if you just want to walk along and visualize it. But of course, you could also, as Jonas said before, the idea is also that you would say, give me all the graffiti that was created, let's say, between um, that election and that election, mm -hmm. so two temporal dates. Right. And then you would get many of those. And this would be, this would then be a kind of list. And indeed, there would be some overlap there. And exactly the same as was discussed yesterday, but Oscar, we don't know yet how we will deal with this. Um, the, the main aim of this was, um, like I said, the platform that we are going to launch will not be as complete as I would like it to be, but I would like that we have as many properties in the background that would allow other researchers to do reasoning with this. And if we would not be thinking about this and launch it and not record all this information, nobody would be able to do temporal reasoning with this. So how we will visualize and do the reasoning, we don't know yet, but we are thinking on what properties do we need to allow temporal reasoning. Why is that? So that's why it's really, it's, yeah, I would like to have presented much more in depth, but we, it's, it's rather slow research. Well, I mean, you have to have an aim in order to start thinking in that direction. Yeah. This is why I was trying to visualize, you know, how we will. Well, yeah, the yeah. first aim was what, what do we really need? And so big discussions were what is visible, what is invisible, is a graffiti still in existence when it is invisible? Because we also would like to that it will seldomly happen that in a case, for instance, that somebody would remove a layer and the layer below it would become again visible, then a new visibility period starts and our temporal model allows for this. Or somebody pastes a sticker, the sticker gets eroded or, or torn down, then the sticker below it becomes again visible. Right. And again, these are the things we were thinking about, how can the temporal model allow for different visibility time spans and periods? So that's why we have in our modification this can be, there can be 10,000 modification events, so to say. And they all have their specific, uh, let's say, time span as well uh, allocated with it. Yeah, because like, if you manage to implement all of these things in the final version of your PR model, I mean, you can stay there like a month <laughs> <If you start. laughs> without taking out the, the heavy layer. Just an infuse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was curious about the Zhilinsky graffito, which appeared to have um, like additions to it that might not have all been the same person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's good. No, 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 indeed. And there you see, there you see how much graffiti changes yeah. uh, along the Donau Canal, right? So Stefan did a tour here and a tour here. This one he took by, let's say by Luke, because he was giving a workshop. Oh. It's also graffiti workshops. Yeah. And you see how much was already added, but indeed this was maybe by five, six, seven, eight different people. Yeah, but, and, but it's kind of preserved as one. Yes, graffiti yes. Sale, but there's no... no. So you see that even yeah. if you're not going out for two days, we miss enormous amount of graffiti. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Stefan needs to live there. More or less, yeah. more or less. Yes. Okay. And he already takes a massive amount of photographs. Yes. Uh, but yes, um, Yes, ideally you would have ro robots or robotic dogs that would observe it. It is, it is crazy. This is also, we have to say this, is a legal spray wall. So it's very often used for workshops. Stefan gives also his workshops there. So it's legal. So a lot of starters, um, a lot of yeah, uh, starters are starting there. Yeah, clearly, that's why they are called starters. So, but yeah, a lot of people are trying out oh, there the first things and it goes very, very fast there. Yeah. There we could really change from hour to hour. Somebody should work on an automated change detection. Postcom? <laughs> there you go. Uh, I think uh, you both first, please. Okay. Now, question about why we want to that certain It's a good question. We also don't know because it is indeed very tricky, right? You would have to go all around these stacks here. Yes. And this is a very time consuming um, effort. And we were thinking also of maybe Benjamin's change detection would automatically allow us to extract these polygons, but then the change detection needs to be extremely accurate. So like I said, this is more at the moment, a thought experiment, how things could work. 
And if we ever pull this off, it will be on a very small part of the donor canal because we cannot do this for everything. This is mental. We would need hundreds of students to do this for us. But we are thinking about it like, yeah, okay, how could we, how could we use this? Because we are also dealing with, we are both archaeologists, so also in archaeology we are dealing with this, and it's also not solved. And what I often tell my colleagues is that I think that it's easier to develop temporal models or temporal tools on a graffiti scape because you see the stratification entering in real time, uh, changing in real time almost, right? So it's easier to reason about than excavating something that's maybe 2,000 years old where a lot of the stratification is already fuzzified by all kinds of processes. So yes, I see this as a kind of opportunity to develop tools and reasoning skills and reasoning tools maybe to the, that can also be applicable to standard archaeological settings. Uh, because uh, we can, it's easier. We can go there every day and see how stuff is changing. And then, in terms of archaeology, here we really see the stratification changing in the correct order. So things are added. In archaeology, you dig from the youngest till the oldest, right? So you have, to, you have to think in reverse. So this also makes the process a bit more difficult to conceptualize. So, yeah, like I said, it's a very big thought experiment. It's something that is personally important to me because I think it would be nice to. Um, have this and it's important also because of this dynamic nature of the donor canal so why is the graffito visible for two days and not on for 20 days does this maybe say something about the first creator or his message that he gets so very quickly crossed right so that's why we do it or try to do it like this